Hello and welcome to this round four here at Pro Tour Amonkhet. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Luis Scott Vargas. And in our feature match area, we have an exciting uh, difference in opinion on how this format goes between our two players in the feature match area. First up, we have, there you see him, Martin User. He was in our feature match area in the draft rounds, but he's back and he has brought with him the mono black zombies deck that's proven quite popular with a lot of pros. Yeah, I, I, I'm many members of uh, Team Channel Fireball Fire have ended up on mono black zombies. Uh, it's consistent, it's aggressive, and it actually has a lot of tools for a resilient mid to late game that you might not expect from a one drop aggro deck. Cards like Dread Wander keep coming back. Uh, Crypt Breaker fuels you up if you get enough zombies into play. And uh, it's even got like the traditional discard elements that Black has. On the other side of things, we have Hall of Famer Masashi Oizo from Team Last Samurai. Both these players finished 2-1 and one in their draft rounds, and Oizo has, well, it's a very cool deck indeed. We'll get a chance to see plenty of it soon enough. New Perspectives combo. So I actually uh, made a video playing this deck, and through that video, I found how hard that deck is to pilot. And maybe that was just me, but I, I think that the deck has a lot of interesting decision trees. What this deck is, is it's trying to cast the card New Perspectives. It draws you three cards, and it makes all your cycling costs zero when you have seven or more cards in hand. Once your cycling costs are zero, whenever you cycle a Shafet Monitor, you get an untapped yeah. land. Whenever you cycle a Vizier of Tumbling Sands, you untap a land. You generate a bunch of mana, cash out of the grave, keep doing it, and win with uh, Approach of the Second Sun is, is a, the most common win condition. In the meantime, of course, while uh, Oizo busily cycling away time to get to the six mana he needs for new perspectives, Martin User, he's on a fairly straightforward plan. He wants to get plenty of zombies in play and presumably beat down before new perspectives can get going. Yeah, that's all Martin can do, especially in game one. He's got no way to interact you know, in any, any, any relevant fashion with Oizo's plan. So that is good for Oizo. Uh, Post-board, Martin gets to bring in hand disruption, but game one is just a race, though. Metallic Mimic's a good start to that race. Yeah, the zombie deck does have a lot of one drops, but when Metallic Mimic comes down first, he has named Zombie, of course, it will now mean that every zombie coming into play with an extra plus one plus one counter, and those add up pretty quickly. Yeah, the addition of basically a, two, a good two drop zombie, which Metallic Mimic, it, well, it, it mimics quite effectively, me means that the zombie deck, along with Lord of the Accursed, has a lot of ways, and Liliana's Master has a lot of ways to give their zombies plus one plus one. So here we see the follow-up there is that uh, Lord of the Accursed. So it, c it comes in with a plus one, plus one counter. It pumps the Metallic Mimic because while it's in play, it does get to count as a zombie. Swings in for three and Masashi Oizo taking his first hit. But in all honesty, considering the number of two ones for one that uh, Martin User has in his deck, it, it could be a lot worse for him. Yeah, starting with Dreadwander or, or Crypt Breaker is a, a lot more ideal for the de zombie deck, especially against a, a pure combo deck. Uh, Masashi's just trying to get to six mana to cast new perspectives here. And tapping full four mana here, Shefet Monitor, one of the more interesting cards in this deck because in addition to cycling, it lets him get to that six mana a little faster. Yeah, turn four Shefet Monitor, turn five new perspectives could lead to a win. In fact, if, if Masashi can find all the tools he needs, he could win as early as next turn. In the meantime, Martin User, he's playing a fairly straightforward game of counting up here, seeing how much he can get through. We can see that he's got plenty of cards in hand. It's just be a matter of how many he can deploy before this is all over. Uh, and Masashi Oizo winning the role, a big deal. It certainly is. And also, especially in game one, the number of removal spells that Martin draws is critical because Martin has, you know, Fatal Push, Grasp of Darkness, Dark Salvation. They're all interactive spells against most of the decks in the format. Not so interactive uh, against Masashi's essentially creatureless deck. Yeah, while there are creatures in, in the list, most of them are there for that important word cycling on there. And we'll see once uh, Mizashi starts going off, if you will, quite how powerful some of the extra abilities on top of cycling really are. Another key component to Masashi's deck is to play Weirding Wood on one of his lands. So now it taps for two mana. And then every time he cycles a Vizier of Tumbling Sands, he generates two mana. Relentless Dead coming down for Martin User. It's got Menace, it's got a plus one, plus one counter, and in those sort of grindy beatdown games, it has a lot of powerful abilities. It does, and uh, Martin is not planning on triggering Relentless Dead in this particular matchup, but he, he is happy just pressuring Masashi and just hoping Masashi doesn't have new perspectives. That's really all Martin can do, but I think that's what Masashi drew for his turn. Right on time. You don't need the six drop until you can cast it, but there it is, and the number of cards in hand important for Oizo. Right now, he has six. When he gets up to uh, having new perspectives in play. He does need to have seven cards in hand before his cycling is completely free. 
Now, one of the advantages of Weirding Wood is that it comes with a clue. It lets you investigate, get a clue. So it replaces itself. It doesn't count as a card cast if you have time to cycle that clue. Of course, that kind of cycling not going to be free for the New Perspectives deck, but drawing cards is drawing cards. I'm sure that Oizo will not mind. Yeah, and you can see in uh, Martin's hand, he's got two Dark Salvations and a Fatal Push. He's got three removal spells in a matchup where they don't do anything, and that, that is one of the disadvantages to playing a deck with removal spells, and it's one of the advantages on the other side for Masashi playing a deck that completely dodges them. Looks like there's a Haze of Pollen in hand here for Masashi Oizo. That has to be a pivotal card in this kind of matchup. It's essentially an extra turn. He, Masashi can cast that and prevent all combat damage, meaning that he has complete control over which turn Martin gets to kill him, because Martin's playing mono black. He doesn't have counter spells. Haze of Pollen will prevent all the damage, and Martin can't do anything about it. And correct me if I'm wrong, Luis, how, uh, the mono black deck doesn't have a huge amount of reach. It's fairly easy for Oizo to predict the worst case scenario that can come from any attacks, right? It, it, it's true. There aren't very many cards, uh, even in this format, that can directly deal damage to the opposing player out of mono black, and Martin is not playing any of them. So Masashi is now thinking, this is where format knowledge is key. He's thinking, well, do I take this, this, this hit of uh, damage and I, do I fall down to basically within range of any, any sort of burn spell or do I just play it safe and cast Haze? Looks like he has gone with the Haze of Pollen. There's going to be no combat damage this turn. Let's see what the follow-up is from user here. I guess at this point he just has to threaten uh, lethal and hope it's good enough. Weapons. So Dark Salvation there, simply making two zombie tokens. And this is the turn. Now Masashi has to either go off or find another Haze of Pollen. I guess conveniently, New Perspectives, even if it doesn't go off, it does draw you a lot of cards to find answers. Yeah, and there, there's a chance Masashi can draw enough cards here and then find another Haze of Pollen and not end up uh, having, to, having to go off, but end up being able to just survive another turn with Haze and then go off the, the turn after. So a cycled Shepet monitor finds another land and that a big piece of the puzzle to actually get things going here because he does need that extra mana. And each Shepet monitor gives you plus one mana, though you do run out of basics eventually. There's only, well, I guess Masashi's playing 10 basics, so he's, it's going to be difficult for him. Uh, some of the lists play fewer. I guess it's a balancing act because there are now cycling lands to consider as well. And they're critical in this deck. Uh, ha having cycling lands is very important. So here we, we see Masashi just putting cards in a graveyard and drawing cards. What he's doing is cycling all these cards for free thanks to new perspectives. And he has enough cycling cards that he, he's able to, to do that many times. And Shadow of the Grave there, a big part of the puzzle as well, because it gets back all of the cards that he's cycled or discarded this turn. Yeah, so you can see him keeping those cards in a slightly separate pile just so, so they know which cards got cycled this turn. And yeah, he, 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 got five, he got back five cycling cards, which is not amazing. This is not a guaranteed win at this point, especially since uh, Masashi has yet to find any Viziers of Tumbling Sands. So looks like he just found one. And that, of course, can untap the land with Weirding Wood on it. That means that he's generating even more mana. And these cycling cards, see, Shadow for five, is, is not huge, but now at this point, if, if Masashi finds another Shadow of the Grave, then he, he will be able to win this turn. And a Haze of Pollen is in hand for Oizo, so if the worst comes to the worst, he's already found a way of buying himself an extra turn, and with all of that mana the following turn, you have to think that it's looking good for him. Yeah, the only disadvantage of waiting a turn at this point is any Shadow of the Graves you draw next turn now won't get back all these cards because you had to pass the turn. So at this point, Masashi is really interested in just ending the game this turn. Another interesting card in this deck, Traverse the Ulvenwald. It, uh, once Masashi has Delirium, which uh, he uh, certainly does by now, he's going to be able to search for a Vizier of Tumbling Sands. Yeah, Vizier of Tumbling Sands, by being able to untap permanents, in this case, lands that are enchanted, is generating mana, it's generating cards. It's kind of, it's like the manamorphose of combo decks in modern. Uh, certainly, it, it, and especially with Woody generating mana of any color, I guess it does mimic that exactly. So. Masashi's found a second vizier, so he's he's well on his way. He just if he finds a shadow of the grave, this should be this should be lethal. And by lethal, let's let's just cover off what the win condition is for this deck because it is a slightly unusual one. Uh, approach the second sun. The first time you cast it, gaining you seven life. The second time you cast it, you are 
going to win the game, but it puts itself down seven cards deep in your library. Presumably getting through seven cards for this deck, not a big deal. And, uh, w yeah, one of the ways Masashi has to do that is, F6. of course, cycling, so... Magic Online, F6. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. And you see, Masashi's got three Shadow of the Grave left in his deck, so he's traversing twice. And basically, he has to hit a Shadow of the Grave before he runs out of cycling cards. He's got to be in pretty good shape here. Almost every card in his deck has cycling. And with each Shepherd Monitor, he's removing one card that doesn't have cycling as well. Yes, so, Martin, when he said F6, he's uh, making a joke about passing priority until end of turn on Magic Online, where he is announcing to uh, Yuya that, he, look, I'm tapped out, I can't do anything. <laughs> he he, he is, is taking no more game actions. Yuya has complete control over what happens the rest of this game. Yeah, if you do find yourself in this matchup on Magic Online, probably worth knowing about that shortcut. Yes, it is. How is this deck to play online? I'm guessing there's a lot of clicking involved. It, it takes a bit, but it is actually a, a, a fun experience because you're just drawing a bunch of cards. So I, I enjoyed it quite a bit when I when I played it. Sure. There we go. So you have found Shadow of the Grave, and he just has to demonstrate that he can cast Shadow, cast Approach of the Second Sun, generate enough mana to cast it again, and draw into it. Is generating 14 mana a challenge for this deck? Not once you've gone off. Yuya, he has eight mana worth of Viziers. Oh. Um, and is, is able to uh, use those and then, of course, uh, find more traverses. Once you have all four Viziers, each shadow gives plus six, as well as the Shafet monitors. And Oizo has clearly been practicing with his deck sufficiently that he's able to rattle through this process pretty efficiently. There's another copy of Shadow of the Grave, and at this point, I think it must be fairly academic. The, the one thing that's funny is, uh, and I don't know if uh, Oizo's actually run into this during testing, if you cast Approach of the Second Sun with fewer than seven cards in your deck, it actually just goes to the bottom. So you could cast it with like two cards left in your deck, and it just becomes your bottom card, and then you can cycle into it. <laughs> Makes sense. I actually had a moment at the pre-release where I cast Approach of the Second Sun when my opponent had a Gideon Emblem in play, and that did not work out too well for me because the second time you cast it, it literally does nothing. But as things stand, Approach of the Second Sun doing it there for Masashi Oizo in the first game here against Martin Yuza. There will be plenty of sideboarding, and we'll catch the rest of those games soon enough. But first, these messages. Rise among the worthy next weekend. Bring your best standard deck to become the Amonkhet Game Day champion of your local game store. Top finishers are awarded full art premium promo cards and an exclusive game day champion playmat for the winner. Find a game day near you at magic.wizards.com slash game day. Amonkhet is now available in Magic Duels. Build endless deck combinations with more than 1,300 unique cards. Play through hours of story with over 60 campaign missions. Play Magic Duels free today on Xbox One, Steam, iPad, and iPhone.
and welcome back to this, the first round of Standard here at Pro Tour Amonkhet. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Luis Scott Vargas, and we've just seen a relatively straightforward, if intricate, win by Masashi Uizo in game one against Martin Yuza. New perspectives combo, largely unimpeded by what the zombies were doing. How much is that likely to change after sideboarding, Luis? So it, can, it highly depends on what Martin has uh, in his sideboard because he's it's the, the pressure's on him to change his deck. He's the, he's the one who actually had a really hard time interacting in game one. Looking at Martin's sideboard, he's got three copies of Transgress the Mind, which are going to be fantastic here. They can uh, snag new perspectives or really um, basically any other card that Martin cares about, Shafet Monitor or Vizier of Tumbling Sands. Past that, he doesn't have a lot, though. Scarab Beast is a card some of the Zombies decks play, and that would be effective, but Martin does not have access to it. Interesting. I mean, with a deck with so few win conditions as Masashi Uizos, at least based on what we saw in game one, is there any potential to snag the approach the second sun and leave Masashi to have to cast his cyclist? Uh, that certainly is a play that, that Martin can make if he sees uh, the approach in Uizos' hand, but it's it's just it's not that uh, likely that it ends up playing out that way. If he does see it, though, that is a good that is a good approach. Well, it looks like. Uh, Martin user here, considering a mulligan, I guess that when you know that there's a relatively small number of cards that interact, it makes mulligan decisions a bit different. Yeah, and, and he he's after after a lengthy scry decided not to go to five, actually. Crypt Breaker on turn one there. And that potentially a source of additional cards if Martin User does need to go digging. You do get the opportunity to tap assorted zombies to draw cards as opposed to simply attacking him with them. And Oizo kicking things off with one of those cycling lands. How much of an impedance on mana development is it to have so many lands that come into play tapped? It doesn't matter a whole lot early game, especially if you you don't if you're not looking to cycle your early cards. It can matter a lot if it's your six mana though. <laughs> that, that at that point you are paying a, a very real cost. Traverse the Elven World here, going to be able to find just a basic land. Meanwhile, Metallic Mimic has come down for Martin User, so his subsequent zombies will be coming into play with plus one plus one counters. And this makes activating Crew Breaker. Uh, a lot easier once he's got a couple zombies in play. He can take a turn off to draw an extra card and try to find, uh, you know, transgress the mind being the, the most important card. Though I think he's already got a copy of transgress in his hand. Though the strategy there is you often are going to want to wait to cast transgress until the turn before Masashi can cast new perspectives because you want to give Masashi the, the highest uh, chance to have one of those in hand for you to grab. So for now, Martin Muser just staring intently at the life total of Masashi Uizo. He's only taken a point so far, but things just getting started here in game two. This is one of the classic dilemmas when you are playing zombies, is uh, whether you want to attack with three zombies or draw a card with Crypt Breaker. And the matchup uh, and the board position clearly dictate a lot of your decision here. At this point, Martin has to decide how much pressure he wants to apply versus whether, how much that extra card is going to help him you know, advance his game plan over the next couple turns. Yeah, worth noting there on Crypt Baker, you're tapping three untapped zombies. If, you, if Martin cast a zombie this turn, he could tap that zombie. It doesn't uh, worry about summoning sickness. You simply need to have the untapped zombies to tap. Correct. And that means that that is why Martin has this decision to make, because otherwise he would be fine just uh, you know, attacking. As it is with Lord of the Accursed, that's a relatively hefty swing there. Five points of damage going through to Masashi Oizo, and this is what user needs to be doing before he starts worrying about the cards in Oizo's hand, is presenting enough of a clock to make life at least a little bit difficult for the Japanese Hall of Famer. Yep. Weirding Wood coming down, there's the clue. And so Martin still knows that Masashi can't cast new perspectives next turn. Uh, he might cast Transgress this turn anyway. <laughs> Unfortunately for Martin, two copies of New Perspectives. You can see him uh, not being thrilled by, the, by this. It means that it might be better for him just to snag Shafet Martyr because that, that is one of the cards that can help uh, Masashi go off once he's cast New Perspectives. The worth noting Masashi, especially if you take Shafet Monitor, does not have a, a six mana yet, though between cracking the clue, maybe cycling Haze of Pollen, he should be able to get there. And Martin having a careful think about this, I guess that he's trying to figure out how quickly he can get damage in what the biggest priority is going to be. And currently, uh, Martin has 
eight points of damage on the table. It's a two-turn clock, though he sees that haze of pollen, knows that Masashi can extend that by a turn. And, yeah, it does not surprise me that he did not go after one of the new perspectives. And now it looks like one mana is going to be left unused here. Just a big old attack here from Martin User. And Oizo definitely on a clock here. Just another cycling land pickup there for uh, Oizo. So Oizo's got four mana this turn. If he plays one of those sheltered thickets, it'll, it'll enter the battlefield tap. So he'll still just have four mana. He has to use two of it on Haze of Pollen. And he's got two mana left to, to, to crack a clue. Looking for an untapped six land and more cyclers, including Vizier of Tumbling Sands. Otherwise, he, he actually will fall to the zombie horde. It turns out Martin does need a lot of pressure or a lot of disruption each game. Just that one piece might be enough, but it, 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 it's highly dependent on, on Masashi's you know, top five or six cards or so, depending on how many he gets to see over the next couple turns. Yeah, if you're the kind of player that likes drawing a lot of cards, it's hard to argue with this deck as one of the options that you should be considering in this standard format. Any game you win involves you drawing like 20 cards in the same turn. It's striking looking at these two decks, the difference in the way that they operate. So that sort of, from looking at just at the board, you'd assume that Martin User was the only one that had really been doing anything, but that's really not the case here. And here's a Hazer Pollen that as we previously mentioned, effectively a time walk. A little better even because it means that Masashi Uizo gets uh, the opportunity to spend his remaining mana on drawing a card off that clear. And here's where those enter the battlefield tap lands hurt. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, that the, the price is being paid because Masashi doesn't have a six land that he can play new perspectives with. He's got to cycle and try to find another Hazel Paul, and otherwise th this will be the end of the game for him. And there we have it. A straightforward beatdown draw from Martin User, plus just one transgress the mind, enough to square things up. That is now 1-1 between Martin User and Masashi Oizo. And we're going to get a chance to look across at one of our other games here in the feature match area. You can see there that we've got a whole host of talent in our feature match area. We are going to be moving back to, by the looks of things to uh, Jacob Wilson versus Panagiotis Papadopoulos. Um, now, if you're familiar with Mono Black Zombies from our previous games, then we've got at least one familiar deck here. The other one, though, is one that I think we're likely to see a fair amount of uh, this weekend, that being Tima Etherworks Marvel in the hands of Jacob Wilson. Yeah. And we already see, uh, you know, looking at the list in the feature match area, Shota Yasuka and Jacob Wilson are both playing Tima Etherworks Marvel, and they're both on different teams. So w you can expect other members of their team to be playing the same deck sensor there. Uh, one of the commonalities between Wilson's deck and the uh, new perspective combo we've seen already, cycling plus the ability to counter spells relevant, but Tyler's tracker is a little bit different. And you're going to see uh, sensor in, in many different decks, including Torrential Gearhook decks, so sensor is a powerful and impactful card in this format. Looks like Papadopoulos with one of the more aggressive draws that you're able to get with uh, zombies, being able to throw down additional one drops good and early, a very big deal for these decks if they're looking to go under what these slightly slower, more uh, controlling or combo explosively built decks are trying to do. Looks like there might be a magma spray in hand though for Jacob Wilson. That one of the cards that you've singled out as being very important in this standard format. It's one of the best cards in Ether uh, in a. I'm a cat. And it's the most important card against zombies. If you could choose a card to have in your opening hand against zombies, it would likely be Magma Spray. You can see it takes out Relentless Dead forever, makes sure it doesn't bring anything else back. And between the Magma Spray and the Tireless Tracker, Jacob's able to hold back uh, all of Panagiotis' attackers. A bit of virtual card advantage for him there. Potentially some more with that clue that comes into play as Jacob Wilson plays an untapped forest for the turn. Four energy thus far. So not quite enough to have Marvel actually go off, but uh, enough that it's threatening to within the next couple turns. 
And it looks like there is a glimmer of genius in hand for Jacob Wilson, so he will be able to get that extra energy pretty shortly. But Panagios is Papadopoulos looking to shorten the clock here, playing Liliana's mastery. That would generate two zombie tokens and pump all of those zombies already in play. Six points of damage coming through here. And so now Jacob has to decide. He can block one of the Dread Wanderers of Tireless Tracker and sack another clue uh, to make it survive. But if he does that, he's not able to cast Glimmer of Genius. And I, I think he really wants to cast Glimmer's turn to set up an Etherworks Marvel activation next turn. So there's a decent chance he just takes the six. The downside of that is that uh, if he then misses on his Marvel spin, he could be in a bit of trouble. But he gets to see a lot of cards. Ooh, including Radiant Flames. And that, that's uh, a card we haven't seen cast in quite some time, but it's going to be very effective uh, when Jacob casts it against this zombie horde. Able to get the full three points of damage through, which will be necessary with Liliana's Mastery to deal with these zombies that are in play. Especially since he even gets to make his Tireless Tracker big enough to survive. The full combo. So Papadopoulos is going to have to rebuild. He's on 20 life, though, so he's got potentially a little bit of time as long as he's able to dodge an Etherworks Marvel for just a little longer. This is game three, so these players, they've got a great idea of what's going on in the matchup. They've each been able to pull off one win. One win, of course, not quite enough. Looking to get that second one so that they can push things on this format, because both these players currently 3-0 and oh from their respective teams, face-to-face -face games and Conflict Grease. I'll leave you to figure out which one's which. <laughs> and uh, Jacob's playing it safe here. He could play Etherworks Marvel, but he's got three copies of Torrential Gear Hulk in hand. He's just going to play the Gear Hulk and start flashing back powerful instants and not worry about spinning and missing on Marvel, assuming he can just win off uh, attacking with Gear Hulk and Tireless Tracker. Papadopoulos here looking at Dread Wanderer. He's just got the one card in hand, so he's able to pay three mana to put it back into play. An extra point of energy there off that ether hub. And the tide kind of turned here. I think Torrential Gear Hulk, one of those cards that has always been good, but it seems like there's so many more options to use with it now that Cycling can put more spells in the graveyard earlier. Just a super powerful card in this format. Yeah, it, it, it's got a lot going for it. And the fact that uh, Blue Control picked up a, a couple new toys to play with makes Torrential Gear Hulk just that much better. Do not worry, of course. We will get a chance to see the full final game between Martin User and Masashi Oizo. We've just paused that one while we're getting a look in here. We can see that it looks like they have kept their opening hands. We will be back to that one soon enough. But for now, Jacob Wilson and Panagiotis Papadopoulos close to a conclusion in their match. And Dark Salvation threatens to make three zombies and then give Tireless Tracker minus four, minus four. Jacob has... A number of different responses here. He can save Tireless Tracker by sacrificing a clue. He can just let that happen and play another Torrential Gear Hook. He, he can also uh, use Harness Lightning to kill Dread Wanderer to make it so Dark Salvation does not quite as much. It does mean that Jacob's not going to be able to win the game this next turn, but I think that he's, he's going to be in fine shape here. He just has access to so many different cards right now. How mindful does Wilson have to be of that Westvale Abbey that's kicking it in Panagiotis' uh, land pile there? Uh, it, it is quite relevant. Uh, when Ormondal comes out, it, you know, it, it'll finish Jacob in two hits here, but, even, but once it's in play, Jacob has a very hard time dealing with it. Luckily for Jacob, he's got giant attackers, and he's going to be forcing uh, Papadopoulos to start blocking. Otherwise, Papadopoulos will actually die to Jacob's Torrential Gear Hulk and uh, Tireless Tracker. They're just making sure there that the sleeves are opaque enough that that double-sided card would not be visible at any point when it's not in play and face up. Uh, and satisfied, the play continues. Dark Salvation making three zombies there. Look, the Westfall Abbey just wants to worship Ormondal in peace. That's all they've ever asked for. <laughs> Look at all of those cards in hand here for Jacob Wilson. One way of telling how you're doing in any 
any game of Magic is, if you've got lots of cards in hand and land to cast them, you're probably in pretty good shape. Harness Lightning there, taking down another one of Papadopoulos' creatures. Wilson, mindful of the number of creatures in play, casts another Torrential Gear. And that'll do it. All right, two games to one for Jacob Wilson, and we get a chance to bounce back to our main match, that between Martin User and Masashi Uizo. We've seen it go beatdown-wise for Uizo. We've seen it go all combo-centric for Uizo. But now we're going to have the conclusion of the match, and this time round, once again, Masashi Uizo will be on the play. And there is the one drop for uh, Martin User. A big deal in terms of the way that the, the damage scales for this matchup. Yeah, Dread Wander on turn one, if this game is going to last five turns, that can represent eight or more points of damage, depending on how many uh, Lord of the Accursed come into play. So having that on turn one is critical because Martin does not have a lot of time to mess around, by, and his multiple twos and threes mean that he's not going to be able to cast all of them before the game ends. Yeah, Dread Wanderer, Zombie Jackal, a big pickup for the zombie deck. And this very much a patchwork quilt in terms of the uh, different sets that all of the pieces come from, gradually picking up enough steam that it can be a full mono black deck and cause all sorts of trouble for opponents. A quiet traverse the Elven World from uh, Masashi Uizo there, just sorting out his mana for later on. And, and one of the things that uh, the new perspective decks really have to do is kind of hold those untapped lands so that their six land drop can be untapped because you're going to run into the problem that uh, Masashi had last game where he had five lands in play, new perspectives in hand and a land drop but could not cast it because he just had you know sheltered tickets. Metallic Mimic coming down. Of the various two drops that are available to the deck, it seems to be a fairly straightforward one to play early on because it does improve all of your subsequent turns. And no reason to name anything but zombie for this zombie deck. Another Traverse the Elven Mild. It's kind of interesting. Does this signal that um, the one thing that Oizo is worried about is lands right now? Because we've already seen the Traverse the Elven Mild be very potent in the late game, too. It, it, it really depends on the texture of his hand. Uh, if, he's, if he's using Traverses early, then it means that uh, he's got enough action to, to go off later. Or it means he's just miss, going to miss land drops if he doesn't. And I think he's setting it up because he does have a copy of New Perspectives in hand that he's going to be able to cycle Shafet Monitor on four, new perspectives on five. And if that's not good enough, Masashi has actually another interesting card he brought in from the sideboard, which is two copies of Fumigate. And uh, Fumigate is going to buy a lot of time, especially if Martin doesn't play around it, because you know, that card wasn't present in any of the earlier games. In the meantime, though, Martin Muser's Pain Train just keeps on coming in. Uh, Lord of the Accursed there coming down. It gets a plus one, plus one counter, but repays the favor, pumps up the rest of the team who do get stuck in. Masashi Uizo now on 12. So Uizo just one turn away from that Fumigate, destroying all creatures and gaining life for each creature destroyed this way. The life gain probably fairly important as well, given that various of these zombies deck can rebuild fairly quickly. It, it is important because, like you said, the Zombies decks have cards like Scrap Heap, Scrounger, or Dread Wanderer that just keep coming back. Uh, Relentless Dead is, li does live up to its, its name. And as a result, Martin's deck is very adept at playing against sweepers like Fumigate. Though the power that Masashi has is he's not looking to Fumigate and get control of the game. He's looking to Fumigate to buy a couple turns. And it will do that even if Martin's threats are resilient. Shafet Manos there being cycled here. That's going to mean that there's a little bit more land available for Uizo. He's on three life, so under the gun in terms of uh, having to pull the trigger on at least the first Fumigate. It is possible that Uizo could draw a card that would make him want to, uh, like between the cycling draw and his draw step, that would make him want to cast new perspectives and try to go off. But it is so much safer to just cast Fumigate and, you know, hope that... Uh, Martin does not draw Transgress the Mind. Now, one important thing to note on that Fumigate there, a piece of text it does not have is cycling. How much does Oizo need to worry about when he's sideboarding, diluting his deck of those key cyclers? He, he cannot over-sideboard. Uh, it is risky to take out too many cyclers, as you, as you mentioned, because otherwise you'll cast new perspectives and just not be able to go off. You'll, you'll cycle three cards and then, then be done. So Masashi's not in a position where he can take out eight cycling cards and think his deck will still function. 
as things stand. This has to be a turn where Martin Users got a little bit of a sweat on because this is where Oizo is getting up to six mana, and we know that that's the point where there's at least the potential for new perspectives to simply win the game. Martin knows there's combinations of cards that Masashi could have that would just win the game on the spot. Luckily for Martin, Masashi's very far away from winning with new perspectives, but thanks to those Fumigates, also not that close to dying. Martin will be able to pay one mana with uh, Roland's Dead to either bring it back or put the uh, Dread Wander back into play. So Masashi can't be happy about that, but he does gain four life on the way out, which means that if he casts Fumigate, he, he will win another turn. Looks like he's just going for it. I like it. So three cards drawn off this new perspective. What is Masashi Uizo going to be looking for here? He's looking for a Shafet Martyr and a uh, Vizier of Tumbling Sands, which he has drawn a Vizier, but he's still lacking more. He needs he needs to draw more than, more than just that because he needs to either go off this turn or more likely find Haze of Pollen, uh, untap a land with Vizier, get a land with Shafet Monitor, Monitor and cast Haze of Pollen to, to survive another turn. That sounds like a fairly com complicated collection of uh, elements. It is, and I think given that Masashi had very few cycling cards to begin with, this is a very risky new perspective to cast. I think he needs his old perspective back. <laughs> so Martin User there with the familiar <laughs> face of someone who is just hoping that they haven't lost the game. And Masashi Uizo looking a little pained himself. <laughs> Masashi does not look happy. And if you're Martin, you're like trying to, th you know, there's a glimmer of hope creep into your chest because you're like, look, I'm dead. I know you can't, I can't do anything about it. What do you have? And Masashi's over there like kind of scratching his head and being like, uh, and wait, wait for it. But I mean, <laughs> as you've mentioned, this deck is very complicated though. So is that look on the face? <laughs> <laughs> a wipe at the brow there, a sigh of relief from Martin Yuza. I think that he thought that it was all over, but as it, and he was right, but not quite in the way that he perhaps thought. Uh, able to get past things there. It looked like Masashi Uizo, he had the option of going for it or trying to buy a bit of time with Fumigate. He went for it, it did not pan out. And that means that Martin Yuza advancing to three and one here at Pro Tour Amonkhet. And that the very last uh, match going in our feature match area, you can see there the other tables have already squared things up. So that means that we are gonna close things out here from round four. And already, I must say, in spite of the fact that it lost, I'm kind of excited about this new perspectives deck. It sounded to me like it would be more problematically inconsistent than I had first anticipated. Yeah, I actually haven't played the deck. Uh, my problem with the deck is definitely not that it's inconsistent because I, I, I think it has uh, a lot of resiliency based on how many cyclers it has. Problem is, can you land a six-mana card without your opponent interacting? You, uh, Masashi just lost a game against Martin Yuza where Martin did not interact at all. All Martin did is just cast creatures, and the new perspective deck still wasn't able to go off. So that that, that is unfortunate for that deck because it is pretty sweet when it goes off. Well, I'm sure there'll be plenty more sweet plays across the rest of today and indeed this weekend here at Proto Ram and Ket. But for now, these messages.
Welcome back to the news desk here as we head towards the end of round number four. It's our first round of standard and we did indeed see, not as a pun, new perspectives. And that's great because it does mean that we're just a little bit more open than we might have been here in standard. Lots more to come there. Now, we're going to focus in on Team Eureka, uh, the European uh, group of players, very successful. Pa Patrick Dickmans on this squad, Emmanuel Gershenson, Steve Hatto of Luxembourg, the Austrian Valentin Mackel, Germany's Mark Tobias, and the Serbian umpteen time national champion Alexa Tellerov. One of the members of Team Eureka, I think, might be down on the floor with our own Brian David Marshall. Let's find out. OK, uh, welcome back. It uh, sounds like we don't have uh, BDM uh, on the floor just at the moment, but we will get that for you. Now, I can tell you that Patrick Dickman was 3-0 and coming into uh, this uh, portion of the event, 3-0 and in draft, along with the best part of 50 or so others with a perfect record. And he was up against Oliver Ox. Um, Oliver Ox, who won Grand Prix Brisbane. We got a chance to talk to him. We might get a chance to uh, play you that in just a little bit. Now, Hatto and Mackle both fell uh, in that round. So they're down at one and three. Alexa Tellerov still playing at one and two. Dickman, in fact, three and one. He lost to Ox. Gershenson, three and one. But pacing Team Eureka is Mark Tobias. BDM, let's see if we can hear you this time. Hi, is this thing on? Thanks, Rich. I'm here with Mark Tobias, Team Eureka. Mark, uh, tell us how your tournament got started. You, you sat down for a draft and you said it was a little bit of an odd one. Yeah, I started with some green cards, but like green didn't seem open, so then there were a lot of decent blue cards which I took, and just packs uh, like pick six or seven. There was an approach of the second sun, the seven mana, you win the game card, oh, I know. and I already had a pacifism from, I picked up earlier, so I figured maybe like there's a green bluish style ramp deck that can splash well and go to the late game, so it may, might go into that. And then the second pack, I had a decent choice between the Otecros monument, the white one and like white aggressive creatures. So I took the monuments trying to stay on the plan, but then I totally got cut. And so I had to switch over in like green, white aggressive, but I was very low on playables and it was, was looking hairy. But in the, in, the, in the third pack, I opened a pack that was totally empty for me. So I had to pick the pouncing leopard or pouncing cheetah or something, yeah. which is barely playable. <laughs> like I had the three mana monument in green as well. So there's kind of, they kind of work together well, but then I got a second pick, uh, the, f the cat lord, the five mana, makes two, two, two one, one cats and pumps all cats and the cheetah. Regal Caracal. Exactly. And the cheetah is a cat too, which is nice. <laughs> but, and then I got a Gideon next and like an Avon Mind Sensor next. And then like I got totally rewarded, I think, because like all the white cards came and then my deck turned out pretty well. Okay. And then you, you went 3-0 in draft. Yes. And then the nervous part, you got to wait out and you got to see if you played <laughs> the right deck in standard. H how did uh, the first round of standard go for you guys? Yeah, it went... went to plan basically we were expecting three big decks and i think we're pretty much spot on like there's a uh, marvel mardu and uh, zombies being the top three decks and like i played against one of them and it seems like we were pretty good with our estimation about the metagame still keeping uh, what you're playing secret here yeah, a little bit <laughs> <laughs> he's playing kg uh so tell me about team eureka tell me about what uh, you know this was once a, a huge team, you know, you know, 22, 24 players now, yeah. you know, you're working with six, you know, a, a group of six. What, what's the team dynamic like? It's very nice. Also, like, for this Pro Tour, we're, like, six in the actual team, but testing, we were also testing with uh, Oliver Polak rotman who's on uh, uh, Hariruya. He was on Eureka before, and we're playing with Pierre Dajon and Magnus Lanto, like, the, the old guys, if you want, if you like, but uh, like they're not in the six-man team, but we're still testing together, so that's that's pretty good. And where, where did you guys hole up? Were you in the states, or did you stay in Europe? No, we, we came like last week. We came to Nashville, and we're like at a, a little bit outside at a hotel, and just got a meeting room, and basically spent 24/7 in there. <laughs> pretty harsh, but it paid off, I guess. And now, where did you guys find yourself in the team standings at the end of the last Pro Tour? I think we were, like, in the middle of the pack. Like, we didn't have any, like, spike finishes, which are pretty important for the points. And so we were, I think, like, 20th or something. But I'm hoping to make a good run here with our team, so maybe we can change that now. 
All right, Team Eureka looking to make a splash in the Pro Tour Team Series. Mark Tobias off to a great start, helping them with his 4-0 start here at Pro Tour Amon Cat. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Congratulations to Mark Tobesch. He was, of course, part of Germany's World Magic Cup team that had such a heartbreaking defeat in the elimination rounds at the World Magic Cup at the back end of last year. Good to see him getting in an early, quick start here at the Pro Tour. Still a very long way to go. Remember, even the best of the best at 4-0, they've still only got a third of their way through their journey to top eight. Because once you get your 12th win, anything beyond that pretty much locks you for top eight. Though we do suspect, because the field is slightly smaller than it's been at a couple of recent Pro Tours, around about 370, 380, that probably means someone round about 12-4 might sneak in. Or at the very least, you may see players forced to play to guarantee their slots uh, in the top eight. So we'll see what happens with that. But that's for tomorrow afternoon. Right now, we're focusing on standard. Um, and I mentioned uh, Patrick Dickman, who uh, fell to 3-1 and one this round, losing to Oliver Ox. Oliver Ox is a terrifically interesting human being, um, been playing Magic forever all around the world. He's done everything, seen everything, except win a Grand Prix trophy. And then he did that just a couple of months ago at Grand Prix Brisbane. Yesterday, our very own Maria Bartholdi had the chance to catch up with your Grand Prix Brisbane champion, Oliver Ox. I'm here on the floor with Australian Oliver Ox. You have four GP top eights to your name, most recently champion at Grand Prix Brisbane. This is your 12th Pro Tour. What's it like oh, to really? come back here 12 times? Yeah, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> uh, it's been, it's great. I it seem to get back on every couple of years and uh, I'm still chasing that chance to actually get on for a whole year, get on the train. But uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I can keep coming back and playing every year or so. And it's a great experience. Good to see all my friends and uh, make new ones each time as well. I'm actually staying with a whole bunch of people I hardly even know this time around. So. Oh, awesome. New yeah. friends. Yeah, whole new team. So tell me, what are you most excited for this weekend? Uh, see how our testing turns out and if we've got the right deck or we picked it all wrong. So we'll find out tomorrow. Are you trying to innovate with your deck choice or did you want to pick something that you knew was pretty solid? Oh, we tried to innovate. Um, I think we've come up with a, ni a nice list that's got some uh, interesting changes to it but uh, it's a bit hard with uh, um, with the standard being on moto for the past couple of weeks it's been really hard to find anything really fresh but uh, are you gonna surprise anybody with some spicy cards I certainly hope so so you've been playing magic for a long time how do you think magic has changed over the years uh, well it's certainly gotten a lot bigger I'm not used to I'm still not quite used to turning up to these events and having so many people here uh, I remember my first PT was 99 and they announced it was the biggest pro tour ever with I think 310 people or something like that and around the same time there was a Grand Prix which was Australia's biggest Grand Prix with about 200 and something people uh, so it's very different now um, in terms of size and the number of people if I uh, get in a cab and someone asks me while I'm in Nashville and I tell them that I'm here for Magic Tournament and they're like oh Magic I know that it's, a, you know, it's more of a, a a well-known well thing, right? One final question. I notice you're not wearing any cowboy boots. We're here in Nashville. Can you tell me uh, what's the deal? Uh, I don't own any cowboy boots, and, I mean, to be honest, I'm not really a cowboy, so uh, it's not my thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, Oliver, uh, good luck to you this weekend. Thank you very much. Could be imagining things, but I don't think Maria was wearing cowboy boots either. Either We will have to discuss this. I, of course, am, but I can't show you those for contractual reasons. So, um, we're heading towards round number five uh, here on day one. It's time for our first deck tech. Now, what's the shape of new standard? We'll piece it together over the coming rounds. But one of the players who's doing very nicely, thank you, at the moment, three and one from Germany, known for modern, what's he brought to standard? Here comes Patrick Dickman. 